Hello and welcome to Frost Over the World in a week which has seen new turmoil on the streets of the Middle East. Thousands of marchers today celebrated the overthrow of former President Hosni Mubarak in Egypt's Tahrir Square, calling it the Friday of victory and continuation. The pro-democracy marchers also made it clear that they still have worries about what will happen in the future. One man remains central to that future. Whilst an army council has taken over the short-term running of Egypt, Mohammed el-Baradei, a crucial figure, an inspiring figure, is being proposed by many as the man to lead Egypt to full democracy. Mr. El-Baradei is the former head of the UN's nuclear watchdog and was a long-time critic of Hosni Mubarak. He returned to Egypt at the height of the revolution, and I'm delighted to say he joins me now from his home in Cairo. Dr. Baradei Mohammed, um, what is, what is uh, the message, what is it you think that today that ordinary Egyptians want now? There are further demonstrations today. Mubarak and his government have gone and so on. What, what do people want today in Egypt? And, or what are they fearful of, perhaps? Well, Sir David, it's, first, it's a pleasure to be with you again. What, what the Egyptian want today, pure and simple, that uh, not only Mubarak is gone, but the Mubarak regime is, is also has to go. And they feel apprehensive, David, that, uh, that the regime is still there, that all what they were looking for has not really been put to uh, put, uh, put, put uh, imp implemented. Uh, the Mubarak government is still there. Uh, the old constitution is just being uh, going through patchwork. Uh, we still have a, an emergency law. We still have a, a ban on rights to establish parties. Uh, people are still detained. So they feel that there is somehow an effort to derail to derail the revolution and just change Mubarak, but keep keep the old regime. And that's why you have three million people today in the Tahrir Square saying, well, we need to see the, our overall objectives, which is a second republic, if you like, being put into place. And therefore, the role of the army at this point should be exactly what? Should it, should it stay where it is now until it hands over power, power can be handed over? Or should the army take more of a back seat now? or more of a front seat? What, what should the army be doing now? Well, I think, I think the army uh, basic role should to protect this infant shift to democracy, Sir David. Uh, they, in my view, should be co-partners, if not taking the back seat. Uh, uh, they should give the front seat to those who made the revolution, the Egyptian people. They would like, the Egyptian people would like to see a new government that re represent the new face of Egypt. They would like to see that the emergency law ha is lifted. They would like to, to be able to make, uh, to establish parties. They would like to see that the transitional period is extended. Now the army is talking about three to six months, which is too short for people, the silent majority, if you like, to organize, establish parties, engage with the people. If, if, you, if you rush into an election, the only people who will benefit from that is the organized groups, which is, which is the old, uh, ruling party reincarnated and, and the Muslim Brotherhood. And with all due respect, you need to give uh, an opportunity to the 80% of the Egyptian who have never been involved in politics to, to be heard and to, uh, to participate in a truly representative democracy. Uh, the army so far, uh, Sir David, ha has been very opaque. Uh, we don't know what is the roadmap. We, we, we don't know what is the timeline. And I, you know, I have been saying for the last few days and supported, as you can see, by just about every Egyptian, that the army need to uh, come out of the barracks and speak to the people and tell them, you know, we have heard what you want. We are going to work with you as partners uh, and we will give you the front seat. I mean, I don't, for example, understand that the head of the army, the Minister of Defense, has appointed himself the a de facto president. I have been calling, for example, for a presidential council, a couple of, a couple of civilians to join with, with somebody from the army. So to show that we are really making a, a, a true shift, 
from a dictatorship, from an authoritarian regime to uh, the beginning of a democratic system. And you cannot just run that whole transition through, an, an, through the army that periodically just come uh, every other day with a terse statement saying we are going to do this or that without anybody understanding uh, the big picture and, and where we are heading. How long would it take to have a properly run election? And how would the country be run during that six months to a year um, while the election takes place? Well, as you know very well, Sir David, that uh, 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 fair and free election is not, is not the, the whole of democracy. Democracy is also building an institution, building parties, uh, and the, the last part of the democratic process is to go to the ballot box. And just to go to the ballot box without, without having in place the infrastructure, uh, it would not be, it might be free and fair, but it will not be representative. I think we should not rush. We should have a, at least a year. The country would be run by a, 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 an undertaker government, you know, that is representative of uh, maybe a technocrats that, that has the credibility of, of the people. Uh, people with experience, uh, the, the, the army will continue to support, undergird, if you like, uh, the, 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 new, the new government. They should be part of the presidential council. Uh, so it is not difficult. It will be uh, to, to run the country and go back to a period of transition, but a period of stability. And uh, we want, this is the first time, David, when something like that happened in the Arab world. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we never had a revolution here for a thousand years, possibly. And as you can see, the major impact in, in the whole of the Arab world, it's, it's a tsunami, as I, as I see it. And we want to make it right, because if we make it right here in Egypt, we will, it will be right, made right in every other part of the Arab world. And Egypt would then be the locomotive that will bring the Arab world, the Muslim world, if you like, to stability to modernity and moderation so it's it's a, it's an unique chance and we should not we should make sure that it will not be derailed in any way and in terms of the next moves um really that that government you were men mentioning should should as it were be just looking overlooking the overlooking the period of up, on, up until the election and so on and would in a sense be the referee the umpire of of, of the rules for the new constitution and so on, would they? Yeah, right. I think I think what we need, for example, is a provisional constitution. This is a revolution. We will have a, 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 a constitutional declaration that will work through that transitional period until we have a constituent assembly to to write a new democratic constitution. What, as I mentioned, David, what they have right now is patchwork with the old constitution, which had nothing to do with a with the democracy. So they need to, again, send a message to the people. Uh, and that's really a very important psychological factor. They want to se send the message to the people, I mean the army, that we are moving uh, completely, separating uh, from the old regime uh, to, a new, to a new regime. We need a rupture with the old regime. And what the people feel right now, that this is sort of a cosmetic change, and uh, we, we still see the old faces, we still see the old institutions, uh, we still see an opaque uh, system of governance. And I just was about to tweet, actually, before coming to talk to you, that the army should listen to the people and should not repeat the same blunder of the, of, of the Mubarak regime. If you, were, if you were convinced that the people, enough people, want to see you as president, would you run for president? Well, this is not my priority, David, as I mentioned many times, right. but if people want to see me as president, I would run. Uh, but I am very happy to, 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 do, to complete what I was set to do, is to shift Egypt from uh, uh, the, the kind of situation where we were treated as slaves into a free and emancipated people, a, a new uh, liberated Egypt, uh, and as a consequence, a new a new Middle East, a new Arab world, a new Muslim world, when we do not have this distrust between the East and the West and all this junk. What we want to see is us to be a part of the same one human family, sharing the same universal values, Sir David. And uh, you said, you wrote uh, in February, that in Egypt there is a whole rainbow variety of people who are secular, liberal, 
market-oriented, and if you give them a chance, they will organize themselves to elect a government that is modern and moderate. I, yeah. I think so. I think, of course, as was any with any society, David, you have the extreme right, you, ha you have the Marxist party, you have the Salafis, you know, the you know, extremist or, or uh, you know, uh, Islamist, but, uh, but every, you know, we have the rainbow. Uh, but I believe you know, in a free and fair election and a re representative election, and that's why I want the transitional period to be long enough for everybody to be able to share and cast his or her vote. Uh, that at the end you will get a coalition that basically uh, rooting for a moderate Egypt, a modern Egypt, a moderate Islam, uh, a subscription to human rights, uh, you know, the basic values of freedom of speech, freedom of religion. I think we are not, we are not any different from, from any other country. And this is a unique opportunity to pull Egypt and the Arab world was it to the 21st century, we have been we have been lagging behind in every area. Rather than talk about you know about how you know stuff like uh, like uh, Shiite and Sunnis, like uh, uh, Muslims and Copt, we need to be talking about uh, science, technology, uh, humanities. Uh, time has you know what the, the kind of narrative we talk about now is is 19th or 18th century, and we need to leapfrog to the 21st century, Sir David. And, and the gateway to that, frankly, as I, b I believe strongly, is the gateway to all of this is a democratic system. What should, what should happen to President Mubarak? Uh, should he be expelled from Egypt, allowed to live in Egypt? Should he be put on trial for what he did as leader? What, what, what should be the attitude to President Mubarak? I mean, my personal view, and of course, there's a lot of anger. You hear now about his huge fortune, you know, and his family. You need about, you know, a lot of the dirt is coming out in the last week or so, uh, Sir David, you know, about corruption, about uh, people enriching themselves, about uh, torture. And however, I think as far as President Mubarak, he's an old man. I, I, I would like him to see him, you know, treated uh, with respect, live in Egypt, die in Egypt, as he wanted to say. And, uh, and give him whatever immunity insofar as his personal, his personal self. But of course, all the money that he has accumulated, or allegedly he has accumulated, it has to come back to Egypt. There's no question about that. All, all the money that has been usurped from Egypt, and with the result that we still have 40% of the Egyptian live under $2 a day, has to come back. And then this transitional year I talked about, David, is has to be, uh, uh, the beginning of a planning, economic planning, social planning. We need to establish an, a society that's socially cohesive, that economically vibrant, that uh, that politically democratic. And we have none of that at this stage. So th the transition also will be a, a period of planning. And once we have a new president, once we have a new parliament, we can then we can then uh, leapfrog, uh, jumpstart the process. And what, and what do you see as the sort of the most crucial uh, foreign policy issue? Is, uh, is it connected with uh, the power of Iran? Well, I think, again, there's a lot of foreign policy issues that we need to revisit. Uh, we we in, and many other Arab countries have concern about the Iranian ideology, but the solution to that is that we need to engage with Iran. Uh, Egypt, for example, does not have a diplom diplomatic relation with Iran for the last 20 years, which is, in my view, is totally ludicrous. You know, every other Western country uh, have a relationship with Iran. In fact, when you have diff when you have this agreement, that's the time when you need you need to engage and you you need to reconcile your differences. We need to continue to work on the Israeli issue and 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 continue to f you know push for a Palestinian state. What happened, David, in the last 20, 30 years in, in the Arab world, that people have been repressed by their own government, feel unfairly treated by the outside world, and this was a ticking bomb to a radicalization, to our extremism. The, the, the Mubarak regime sold this theory to, to, to the West that after Mubarak, there will be chaos, there will be a religious state, and, and that, you know, that we will be hostile to, to, to the US and Israel and everybody else. This is, these were all fictions. I mean, a, a democratic Egypt, and a, a, a democratic Arab world would be in a much better position to present you know, their grievances on a negotiating table and, and have the assets 
to hopefully arrive at a fair and equitable solution because there will be balance of power. They will have assets to put on the table. Right now, it, there is a disequilibrium uh, in terms of balance of power in the region, a sense of humiliation, a sense of anger, and therefore, what you see is increasing radicalization in the region. So this is, I used to call it, uh, uh, pseudo-stability, and, and, and this has been proven in the last few weeks. And uh, you mentioned that uh, a few weeks ago, the people of Egypt, you sensed there was no hope, they had lost hope. And then after the revolution, uh, you said they had found hope again. Uh, is that still the feeling today? Is there still that optimism to go forward to what you've been talking about, the, uh, the new Egypt? Very much. I, I think, you know, we had 60 years with a culture of fear and people lost hope that anything could change. Uh, we have been mobilizing for the last few years. Since I came back, at least for a year, I have been engaging with the young people because I put my lot with the young people. They are the future. They have no hidden agenda. Uh, the older generation has been either co-opted by the regime or have been uh, trying to protect their perks, you know, and I realized from day one that if we need to change, we need to change with the young people, and that's what happened. And I was also trying to make them understand that change will come on their hand. There is nobody who is going to come on a white horse and provide them with salvation. Luckily, that was what, what, what happened. But uh, you, you look at the Egyptian now, David, it, it's a different people. A um, couple of weeks ago, I, I looked at, at the Egyptian eyes, they were dead souls. I look at them now, they are full of self-confidence, they are full of, of pride, they are full of hope, and I don't think there is no going back. And I hope that the army will understand that uh, once this has taken place, once people f started to feel the taste of freedom, there's absolutely no, no going back. A, a major psychological factor, David, I think I should give them their due, is the Tunisians. You know, once the Tunisian revolution took place, uh, the message, a very powerful psychological message, came from Tunisia to Egypt. Yes, we can. You know, that no matter how uh, uh, brutal the regime, we still can overcome that if we get together as people. The power of the people uh, finally is uh, proven itself yet again that no matter how awful the regime, if people get together, and I kept saying, our strength is, is in our number. And you look today at the, uh, in Cairo, I mean, or last week, there was the whole of Egypt in the street, and there was no regime that could stop the, stop the power of the people. And, and that, that's still the same situation. Everybody is hopeful because they know they took back into their own hand their power as, as, a, legitimate, as a legitimate authority uh, in, in Egypt. We hear more today from Bahrain, obviously, more about uh, riots in Yemen and so on. This process of freedom is going to continue, is it? I think so. I mean, again, Tunisia was the pioneers. Egypt came second. I think now we see what's happening in Yemen, in Bahrain, in, in, uh, in, 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 every, everywhere. In, in Libya even today there are protests. I mean, these are unthinkable when you, a few weeks ago that these countries will, people will be able to organize and, and call for human, their human rights and human dignity and equality and, and justice. Well, it's been an incredible uh, delight and a, a privilege to talk to you at this crucial moment in history. Thank you so much. Sir David, it, has, it is always a pleasure to talk to you and I'm always available for, to, to continue the dialogue. Thank well, you very much. Headlines are calling it the Facebook revolution and the Twitter diplomacy. The Middle East's latest unrest has revived once again the debate about the power of social media. This week, US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton said that the internet has become the world's town square, the public space of the 21st century. But are these revolutions all about the internet and social media? Joining me now from Washington, D.C., is media consultant and veteran journalist to boot, Jeffrey Gannam. Welcome, Jeffrey. Tell me, um, thank do you very you much. It's my pleasure to be here. De delight to have you with us. The, uh, tell me, do you think that these events in Tunisia, Egypt, Bahrain, we hear more about Yemen today, and so on, could the 
revolutions, the near revolutions and so on, could they have happened without the internet, do you think? Uh, without social networks? Or were they an essential part of making these events happen? Well, uh, two-part answer to your question. Social media has revolutionized the way Arabs of all walks of life are able to communicate and participate in what was a virtual civil society that is now extended to the streets of Arab capitals across the region. To say that they are Twitter revolutions or Facebook revolutions really underestimates the core social ills, Ills at the heart of these protests. Uh, would they have occurred without social media? Social media added to the mix amplifies and disseminates for public consumption uh, the, the social ills making them extremely difficult to ignore. That is to say, uh, the core social ills of unemployment, of disenfranchisement, of lack of political participation. These social ills are, 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 are fundamental to revolutions throughout history. Could really skilled um, authority figures, governments, could they use these media themselves to fight the protesters? Or is it a pure protesters medium? In fact, governments who are uh, uh, very skilled at controlling the internet, at filtering the internet, and in many cases blocking various websites throughout the Arab world, um, have been able to leverage social media sites for their own particular pur purposes. It, it has been reported in Egypt. Um, uh, not quite clear if it occurred in Tunisia, but it wouldn't surprise any of us if it did. Um, whether it's occurring in Libya, in Algeria, in Yemen, in Bahrain, um, really remains to be seen. This is an evolving story. And it, it, again, it, it has occurred on, the, on, on behalf of governments to be able to use these platforms in the same way to pursue their own messaging goals and their strategic communications. Um, it, so by and large, it's been a protester's medium but increasingly, governments are catching on to the idea that they need to send their own word, word out and are leveraging these platforms in ways that is um, not quite as, unfortunately, not quite as honest and truthful. I mean, people are calling it government propaganda and uh, deceitful messaging and, and uh, other forms of communications that um, aren't really serving the government's interests. Well, at least people are realizing also, of course, that uh, one of the great ways of reaching people all around the world is via Al Jazeera English. That's another vital, vital force in the world at the moment. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jeffrey, for being with us today. Absolutely. A, pr a pleasure to have you with us yet again. We'll see it's you soon. It's been my pleasure. In a moment, I'll be joined by the Mexican movie director, Alejandro Gonzalez in Aritu. That's after this short break, why you can be practicing your pronunciation.